Good day, Year 10. It's lesson four of the Nazi, Living in Nazi Germany course, and this is the rise of Hitler from Chancellor to Dictator. You should have already watched the video clip on the Show My Homework section, and therefore I have a few questions for you. First of all, what exactly happened? Who are the main characters here? Uh, secondly, how did it go from Hitler being made Chancellor, which we dealt with in the last lesson, to Hitler's first attempt to try and condense power into his person. What major event took place and how did Hitler deal with it? Now, if you're doing these lessons properly, you'll pause at this point to write down your answers before we continue. So, you should have known or should have noticed the main players in this uh, drama so far. You've got Hitler himself, you've got Josef Goebbels, he was the fellow in the suit when Hitler was still at the window, the last person before Hitler himself to talk to Ernst Röhm. He's the weirdly tall man without a bum head. Um, Ernst Röhm in real life had a middle parting and looked like a proper bum head. I will show you pictures of him later. Um, the other fellow in that scene where uh, Ernst Röhm walks into the room is uh, Göring with a weirdly ginger hairdo. Um, in real history, as far as I'm aware, he didn't have ginger hair, uh, but he was as preening as the man that show, uh, sort of is acting him on that level. Now the event is the Reichstag fire. Uh, if you remember, the Reichstag is the German or version of Parliament. It's the old Weimar version of how they ran the country. The Chancellor was kind of like our Prime Minister. The President, if you remember, is the head of state, and he's General von Hindenburg, who is recently appointed Hitler as Chancellor. Hitler knows that Hindenburg doesn't like him very much. You may remember that from lesson three. Furthermore, Hitler needs something, as he says, he, he needs some kind of primal thing, some kind of excuse to put things in motion. Now, the reason you've got uh, Goering sort of doing a wry smile, I've never seen him so happy, is because the rumour is that the Nazis started the fire themselves. And there's certainly a fair bit of evidence to suggest that maybe they had a hand in it, or at least didn't try to stop it. Um, in a later meeting, uh, General Halder will later allege that Goering himself slapped his thigh and said, the only person who knows anything about the Reichstag fire is me, for I set it. Whether or not he did is irrelevant. The point is the Nazis gained from it and they gained supremely from it. And they gained through something called the Reichstag fire decree. However, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, if I look down, annoyingly, and I show you this, this is the one of the later slides on the PowerPoint that's attached to show my homework. You may not have looked at it yet, and that's fine. Um, uh, this slide here, as you can see, will show you everything you need to know. It's got all the questions you need to answer from what I'm about to talk through. It's got a source question on there, we'll talk about that later. It's got the chart on there, which I've attempted to make more colorful, and it's got a timeline. Uh, the next slide in that sequence looks like this, and you'll see there are two sections, uh, but they're exactly the same. The idea is you print them off, you stick one side of it in your exercise book or whatever else you're using to keep your notes at the moment, and that way you don't have to write down the full timeline. So I thought I'd do us all a bit of a favour by actually for once trying to show that in the first place. Um, because the last time I've done these PowerPoints, I haven't shown you that bit to begin with, and that gets really weird for you guys. So hopefully you've got those ready before I begin. So now I start with this, we've got the key question for the lesson, which is how did Hitler consolidate his power? How did he go from being chancellor, being appointed by Hindenburg and being, well, liable to be sacked at any moment, and how did he become a dictator with his power utterly secure. The exam board are absolutely obsessed with the idea of violence versus legal methods. I think that's a useful way of setting up an essay. And there are three key events. I don't think it's as simple as saying that one event is violent and another event is legal. I think there's elements of both, violent and legal, in each of the three key events. So I'm gonna try and explain that in a moment. But the first thing first, Oh, my title works. Excellent. By the end of this session, which in an actual classroom setting would take about two lessons, so this will be about two hours worth of work. You'll see how it works in a moment. I'm hoping that all of you will have a secure timeline of events uh, that Hitler was part of that helped make his power in Germany more secure. I'm hoping that most of you, by the end of this lesson, most of you, by the end of the course, all of you, but most of you by the end of the lesson will be able to explain at least uh, three events uh, and their importance. You'll be able to tell me what they are, how they helped Hitler secure his power, and whether or not they were legal or uh, 
violent and, and how far they are both. My, my contention is, by the way, that all three events that I'm going to tell you are both and they're varying degrees. So you can then decide violent or legal depending on these three events. Uh, some of you by the end of this lesson, all of you by the end of the course, will be able to explain the relative importance of events. You'll be able to rank them in order and explain why you've put them in that rank. One of the key things in history is all about explanation. So in an essay, you'll be able to tell me why a particular event is more important than another event. And you won't just be left with, here is the first one, here is the second one, here is the third one. Or worse, going for, well, the first event is the most important. Without it, the other two wouldn't have happened. That's called a contingency argument. It's probably valid, but you can't just, just have that. You've got to have other reasons that you've got to be able to balance in that. So some of you, by the end of this, will be fairly confident of being able to do that. By the end of the course, after you've written it down and you've revised from it, I'm assuming all of you will be able to do that. But, but we'll see how we go. So there it is. How did Hitler secure his power? Much simpler than the question I faced you with at the beginning. Um, and I'm going to go through the steps towards dictatorship. Now, I should point out at this point, you should have already printed off the slide that I showed you at the beginning, stuck it in your book and be ready to annotate. If you haven't done already, pause the video now. You can always come back to it later and stick that in. Uh, stick it in the middle of a page. You've got space around the outside to write down the extra bits. I'm going to assume that if you have needed to pause, you've done so. And if you haven't, you've just had a very weird moment where I stare into the camera and don't move. So the first step towards dictatorship we've already seen. It's the Reichstag fire of the 27th of February, 1933. This burns down the building that is the parliament of the old Weimar Germany. The symbol of Weimar Germany is now gone. And with it comes this new fear of the German population of terrorism. The guy that was uh, claimed to have done it was a bloke called Van der Lubbe, careful with the pronunciation, careful with the spelling. And he was Dutch and a communist, therefore embodying two things the Nazis have been telling people to worry about, immigrants, foreigners, and communism. And a lot of people were prepared to accept that straight off. Now, there is evidence to suggest that Van der Lubbe, a communist, fell out with the German communists over their decision not to oppose Hitler and wanted to do something big and symbolic. And you can't get much more symbolic than burning down the Reichstag, um, which is kind of a key building in the capital of Germany. Following this, the very next day, the Nazis suspend normal civil liberties in something called the Reichstag Fire Decree. Now, if you remember from a previous lesson, a decree is where a president passes a law without Reichstag saying anything about it, without going to uh, the German parliament and asking them for their thoughts. This was normal, if you remember, there were 98 cases uh, in one year. I think it went up to 108 before it finally stopped being used. And the Germans are used to this. This meant that you weren't allowed freedom of speech, you weren't allowed freedom of association. And you might be saying, well, what, what does that mean? Um, which is a perfectly valid question. So freedom of speech means you can say what you like in a newspaper. And under the Reichstag Fire Decree, that was suspended. Newspapers were not allowed to say what they wanted. If they said something the government disagreed with, you could be arrested. Furthermore, there were sweeping powers of arrest given to uh, the police to round up potential terrorists. In this case, anybody that associated themselves with being a communist. And thirdly, there was no freedom of association. And that means that you had to, well, if, if your friend had been arrested, you too carried suspicion. But anyway, I'll go over that a bit more in a moment. Um, 5th of March, 1933, this is an election year. And if you remember, I said the last time there was a free election, the Nazis got 37.3% of the vote. Why did I stress the free election part? Well, it's all down to um, this bit here. This idea that the Reichstag elections that take place in March 1933 are not free. They are protected by that paramilitary, that private army group, the SA, because they're worried about terrorist attack. The Nazis gained 288 seats within that, um, which is pretty huge, to be honest, in a democracy. So even when they've got everything going for them, it's not quite enough to run the country, though. But like I say, more on that in a moment. On the 24th of March, 1933, you'll notice this in bold. It's the next, the three big events. You've got the Enabling Law or the Enabling Act. Both of those will work perfectly fine, by the way. Act just means that it's passed by Reichstag. Law means it's passed into law. I don't mind how you refer to it. Both are perfectly valid. It's passed 
in uh, and you know it's a four-year enabling law they have to come back to it every four years it's passed in 1933 and it's passed in the new reichstag they can't pass it in the building of the reichstag that's been burned down they have to pass it somewhere else in the Kroll opera house but more on that in a moment uh, on the 31st of march 1933 hitler closes all state parliaments now germany is split into states it's a federal system that is there is a central government in berlin and there are lots of other state governments in places like Bavaria, Baden, Württemberg, Saxony, um, Brandenburg, uh, Rhineland, and so on and so forth. There are many different areas, is my point. Each of those has its own government, and each of those gets elected by the people that live in the state. And each of those did not have, necessarily, Nazi majorities. The Nazis want complete control. Hitler recognises he's going to need everything in his power to make sure that he can gain control of the entirety of Germany. His position, if you remember, is not secure. To combat this, he closes down all state parliaments, and whilst they are closed, he passes a law using the enabling law, saying that all state parliaments have to reflect the same uh, makeup as the main Reichstag, where the Nazis have a majority. They don't have a two thirds majority, i.e. they don't control two thirds of all the seats in the state, uh, in the main parliament in the Reichstag, which means they won't control a two thirds majority in each of the state parliaments. This is important. You need a two thirds majority to change the rules by which you run a country or state. In this case, we call that a constitution. Uh, C-O-N-S-T-I-T, constit, U-T-I-O-N, constitution. I had to think about that one. Um, that's the rules by which you run a country, and they need two-thirds majority in order to change those. Well, they don't have that yet. That's what Hitler was talking about when sooner or later we shall have uh, the constant Germany and then we shall have control. Um, that's what he meant by holding his nose and entering the Reichstag. The next thing he does on the 7th of April 1933 is he passes the civil service decree. Remember, they're worried about terrorism. They're worried about the fact that van der Lubbe was working from the inside. He wasn't, by the way, but it's a useful method. The people that they ban from working for the civil service, that is all the people employed by the government, are communists, obviously, they burned down the Reichstag. Women, that's an odd one, we'll come on to that later. Jews, because apparently they can't be trusted. And a number of other categories. The point is the big three of those. And to replace those people who have now been sacked because they may or may not be communists, because they may or may not be women, I suppose that's harder to hide, and they may or may not be Jews, they recruit, well, Nazis, because they're the only people that can be trusted, um, as far as the Nazis are concerned. They're the only ones that absolutely aren't terrorists, at least in the way that Nazis view terrorism. On the 2nd of May, 1933, they shut down trade unions. Now, I don't know if you noticed, the 1st of May is International Workers' Solidarity Day. It is a communist and socialist holiday. It was a bank holiday granted to the working classes in recognition of the fact that they were essentially keeping the Industrial Revolution going. It was the bare minimum demand of the working classes around the world. I don't know if you noticed recently that ours has been moved to the 8th of May uh, to commemorate the VE Day celebrations. Interesting shift of hand there. I don't know if you've also noticed a bunch of things going around about playing uh, Churchill speeches and, and having virtual street parties. I'm a little uncomfortable about that kind of nationalism and hopefully this course will explain why. I don't think it's wrong necessarily. You, you might be really looking forward to that and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But hopefully you'll see why I'm a little uncomfortable with um, overt displays of any kind of nationalism, even if I happen to live in the country, the nationalism is being done. But the 1st of May was a bank holiday. Now, it wasn't a bank holiday in Germany until the Nazis granted it. So all the working class go on holiday, all the workers are at home, and their trade unions that represent their interests are also on holiday. And on that day, Hitler orders the SA, it's them again, to go around all the different headquarters of the uh, trade unions and shut them down and bar them. So that when they come back to work on the 2nd of May, there are no trade unions. And a law has been passed essentially saying, you don't need them. There's no need for trade unions. You've got what you wanted. You've got your bank holiday. What more can you possibly ask for? From now on, we shall work in partnership. And this was announced on the 2nd of May, 1933, which means he kind of gets away with it. 
The next one is the 10th of May. Um, Hitler finally gets round to banning the Social Democratic Party of Germany, the SDP, as being a communist party, uh, as being part of that terrorist plot to burn down the Reichstag. It says, look, if you're a member of that party, you are automatically suspicious, and therefore I'm just going to ban the party entirely. They're not allowed to turn up to Reichstag. They're not allowed to turn up to make decisions. We can't trust them. If you're a member of that party, that in itself is an illegal act. You shall be arrested and you shall be sent to jail until we can find out what to do with you. Now, bear in mind, there's no crime they've committed. They cannot go to court, not yet. And they can't be sent to jail, not yet. So they use something else. And we'll talk about that when we talk about how the Nazis keep control. But here's a sort of hanging thread for later in the course. On the 24th of May, 1933, Hitler gets around to it and he bans the Communist Party, the KPD of Germany, the Communist Partei Deutschland. Uh, in German, uh, for German reasons, communist is spelled with a K. So, communist. Um, and they finally get banned. Now, by this point, we can be reasonably certain that anybody that had been a key communist had already been arrested because of those whole sweeping of powers of arrest back after the Reichstag fire. Why it takes them so long, I, I, I don't know. You could ask that question, so we'll serve. Well, surely you do that first. I don't know. It takes them till the 24th of May. Maybe it's just tying up loose ends. In July 1933, and be careful with the years here, uh, Hitler passes the law against the new formation of parties basically saying that no new political parties are required in Germany. You can only um, be politically active in an existing political party. But he shut down the old most powerful party. If you remember the Social Democratic Party of Germany, the Socialists, the SDP or the SPD, has already been shut down. So no one can make a new Socialist Party. The Communist Party has also been shut down. No one can make a new Communist Party now. The Zentrum Party, more on them later, they're mainly Catholic, uh, they're the centrists, they're like the Lib Dems, I suppose, in our current system. They have also voluntarily shut down at a time of national crisis. They believe it would offer too much, um, too much choice. And when I say voluntarily, air quotes, massive, outside the box here. Um, voluntarily. Uh, the German People's Party, the DNVP, uh, a huge nationalist party that had been quite a big player. They, they provided Stresemann, who steadied the ship under Weimar Germany. Don't worry. He was a cool guy, kinda, and a bit of a nationalist. They also voluntarily disband, voluntarily disband, leaving the Nazis, the, uh, what was it, uh, the NSDAP, being the only party you're allowed to join now. At this point, Germany becomes a one-party state. And we begin the whole idea of a, uh, a Nazi dictatorship, the Third Reich. Next point, and notice the change in year, is the 30th of June, 1934. So we go from July 1933 through to the 30th of June, 1934. You've now seen that switch. I've done that backwards. Um, this is the Night of the Long Knives, Die Nacht der Langen Messe. Uh, auf Deutsch, yeah? Um, the Night of the Long Knives, or N-O-T-L-K. If you write N-O-T-L-K in an exam, any examiner worth their salt is going to know what you mean. It means the Night of the Long Knives, and it's far easier to write N-O-T-L-K than it is to write it out in full, Night of the Long Knives. So I would recommend it. A bit like Treaty of Versailles, T-O-V. Uh, this is Night of the Long Knives, N-O-T-L-K. Apparently, I can't remember my letters. Uh, this is where, basically, Hitler takes the SS and he orders the SA to go on holiday. And because he's worried about them looking a bit bad and people are worried about the SA, you might remember from that clip at the beginning that even the army is getting a bit ooh, under the collar about the SA and their abuses of power. Uh, Hitler basically orders them off on holiday to a place called Bad Weisse. Uh, it means uh, Weisse Bath or the White Sea Bath. Um, they go on holiday there. Hitler turns up, stands on a boat while the SA do all the business, and 200 of them are shot. Um, whilst also across Germany, anyone that Hitler doesn't like or has fallen out with is also shot by the SA, who are using weapons supplied by the German army. Um, it's a bit of a complicated situation. I'll talk about that more in a moment. The final thing, or the penultimate thing, is in July 1934, Hindenburg dies. He's an old man. There's no suggestion of foul play here. The Nazis aren't going around assassinating people like Hindenburg, who's a national hero. He just dies. He's old. 
he dies of being old. And at that point, Nicholas says, well, there's no point holding elections for a new president. You already have me. So I will combine the uh, office of chancellor and the office of president, and I shall put them together, and I'll call that new office Führer, which in English means leader. I shall be your leader, he says. It'll be a sacrifice, but I'll try. After all, there are no other political parties. Who is going to stand against him in an election? Why would they waste money holding an election with one person in it? You get the idea. So at that point, Hitler becomes Führer, which is what we know him as for the rest of the war. I say we. It's what historians refer to him as for the rest of the war. Don't worry, there's no respect gained here. It's just a German word for leader. On the 2nd of August, 1934, Hitler cements his power by taking the last group that can actually get rid of him, the German army. Uh, sometimes I'll refer to them as the German Wehrmacht. Uh, it just means army. Don't worry about it. It's just me using German terms. I can't help myself. Uh, and they swear an oath of personal loyalty to Hitler, not to Germany, not to any high ideals like freedom or, or the German people, but specifically to Hitler. And the German army takes this very, very seriously, a bit like our own army. Our own army swears an oath of allegiance to the Queen, not to Britain, not to the UK, not to the Prime Minister, not to Parliament, and not to you or me. They swear it to the Queen, and they take that very seriously. Armies are weird creatures that they are birthed out of the society from which they come, but they have their own rules. And so when they swear an oath of personal allegiance to Hitler, the army become tied to Hitler's fate. Whatever happens to Hitler, the army will follow through to the end. And it's worth keeping that in mind when we analyse later what happens in the Second World War and why it is so weird, why that Battle of Berlin is such a climactic battle that you've already seen in that, well, hopefully you've already seen in that image and music thing that I failed miserably to put together for you. So, key points and issues. Uh, I'm going to have to remove my screen here. Hold on, how do I do that? Uh, I don't do that. That doesn't work. Um, I do that. Hooray! So, Hitler's position in January 1933, when he takes power, remember it's the 30th of January 1933, where he's made Chancellor, and his position then is not particularly strong. There are several people and several ways those people can use who want rid of him and can get rid of him. Uh, oops. So yeah, he has two needs. He's got to consolidate his power and he's got to destroy all those people that will work against him. If you remember from the last video clips, uh, not the one today with this video, uh, the one on the previous lesson, lesson three, um, one of the rivals he faces is a bloke called Gregor Strasser, who'd been approached by Hindenburg to be the next chancellor instead of Hitler, the idea being it would split the party. Uh, Strasser had been ordered to resign, which he had done, um, but there are other people that are rivals. Ernst Röhm had been using Hitler's face uh, on a photograph for target practice um, with his SA because he'd fallen out with Hitler over that whole deal um, with where well, basically he was told to just keep his army in check and not have a revolution. Um, Ernst Röhm wanted something called the Brown Revolution, more on that in a moment. Um, so he needs to destroy his rivals in his own party, his internal enemies. And he also needs to consolidate his power to make sure that no one can sack him. His external position is rather weak. The last time we talked about this, it was that temporary triangle, if you remember. You had, um, who was it, Hindenburg and von Papen, bar, bar, holding him up on his shoulder, on their shoulders, waiting for him to take the fall for some rather unpopular decisions that would have to be made, uh, and some promises that he simply couldn't keep. He's in a fairly weak position. There are two ways, therefore, that he tries to shore up his power and tries to ensure that he's got what he needs. There are violent ways, where you take somebody and you beat their head until it goes into a bloody pulp. And there are legal ways, where you try and do things by politics and you try and make things work for you. The first major event that I'm going to use to illustrate this is the Reichstag fire. And Many people at the time and afterwards are prepared to accept this might be a communist conspiracy. The word conspiracy you may remember from year nine, and it refers specifically to a group of people making a plan. If more than one person is involved, you have a conspiracy. The question here is, does the Reichstag fire 
count as a conspiracy. Van der Lubbe, careful, two Bs. Van der Lubbe worked, as far as he was concerned, alone. If that is the case, well then it's not a conspiracy. Uh, by the way, when he was arrested, apparently the first thing he said to the police was, I worked alone, no one helped me, I did it myself. It's an odd thing to say when you're first arrested, when you don't really know why you're being arrested. He was found with fire lighters in his bag, again, a fairly weird thing to be carrying around with you. Um, and estimates vary, but it's unlikely that he would be able to carry enough fire lighters to set the whole thing ablaze on his own. Something's odd here. Something doesn't quite work out right. Um, various pictures of him show that he's been beaten up by the police as well before he gives any kind of confession. Uh, what is the consequence of this? Well, Hitler can do what he likes. It's a time of national emergency. Now, it used to be that I could explain that um, in a bit more depth and I could refer to things like the Twin Towers, but we are 20 years on now and it's difficult for us to understand what was going on in that terrorist attack. Equally, we've had terrorist attacks since where the government has not made major changes. And we're so used to our privacy being invaded now that perhaps what happens next with the Reichstag fire decree doesn't sound that weird. Um, we're used to people recording pretty much everything we do. However, Germany had just come out of a period of intense democracy. They'd just finished with the Weimar Germany experiment. They weren't used to having their freedoms limited that way. But if you remember, there are large numbers of Germans that didn't like the way things were going. They said, well, this is, this is too much. Uh, we, we need some means of, well, clamping down and stopping this freedom. There are people kissing in the street. Um, and so, you know, we, we need to calm things down, go back to a proper way of doing things. We'd be more conservative, small c. And so this idea of a, a Reichstag fire decree, this idea of limiting freedom, uh, didn't actually cause that much of an uproar. Most people were perfectly prepared to accept that and were perfectly prepared to uh, see what happened. So you could argue this law affecting civil rights, this law that got rid of the idea of freedom of association, freedom of speech and uh, freedom of belief, is fine. It's, it's, it's a legal method. However, you see the next point I've got there, violent and legal used together. And that's a very deliberate thing. The violence here will be the Reichstag fire itself. Furthermore, those sweeping powers of arrest given to the police, the police simply couldn't cope. They didn't have enough policemen in places like Berlin to arrest all the communists they knew of. Now, equally, a lot of the communists resisted arrest. What were they being arrested for under what law? So the guy in charge of the police at the time, Goering, simply says, all right, easy. We need more volunteers. I happen to have, know a lot of people who'd like to volunteer. There is a stipulation in German law that says we can get volunteers to help out the police. And that's fine, we just pass them all. I'll, I'll personally do it. Have you guessed who's volunteering yet? Yeah, it's the SA. Of course it's the SA. They all join, and because there aren't enough police uniforms to go around, they just wear their own. They're wearing their brown shirts, their little Nazi armbands, they're wandering around, they already know all the communists. They go and find them and they say, oh, you're resisting arrest. Psh, why are you resisting arrest? Psh, stop resisting arrest, kick, kick, back. And then they bring them all bloodied and battered to the police station. What happened to him? Oh, he resisted arrest, mate, sorry. And then they go, oops, he fell into the cell. Thunk. Um, oh no, he fell off the bed. And you get the idea. There's your violence. The law itself is the legal side and it gives the um, legal backing to Hitler's idea of taking power. But the way in which it's done is the violence. And so you begin to see that I don't think you can typify any of the events I'm going to talk about as being one or the other. They are all of them violent and legal and you've got to understand how they work together. In an essay what you do is you'd have three paragraphs, you're fairly used to this idea now, and you'd have violent and legal in that same paragraph and then maybe balance it out what is mostly violent or mostly legal. Obviously, it's both. Your job is to work out how much of each. Don't sit on the fence, you'll get splinters. Uh, I don't mind which side you come down on, provided you explain it. So that's that. Uh, by the way, that is a, uh, an original photograph. It was carried in all the press. It's quite a scary looking photograph. You see the whole thing ablaze. Um, the next event I'm going to talk about is the enabling law on the 24th of March. Now I've got a bit more on this. Here is a chart that you can see on the screen for yourself. And in that chart, you've got the number of seats each party gained in the March elections in 1933. 
you know that the Nazis have gained 288. The enabling law would make Hitler utterly chancellor, uh, sorry, utterly dictator. Reichstag wouldn't be able to stop him. He would get the power to pass laws by decree. He wouldn't have to go through the president, Hindenburg, who doesn't like him. Now, I said on the show my homework, the first clip would overlap with the second. There's a reason for that. In the film Hitler, the Rise of Evil, where Robert Carlyle plays a brilliant Hitler, you've already seen some clips, um, they kind of telescope uh, the enabling law into the Reichstag fire decree, presumably because they'd already gone on for an hour and 20 minutes by this point, and they really needed to get to a conclusion. So it's an easy way to sort of skip over some things. Uh, but using the chart on the left, why were the Nazi party not able to rule on their own just yet? Uh, it says, think carefully and be prepared to defend your answer. You've got five minutes. You can take as long as you like. You can pause for five or 10 or 15 or just for two, whatever it takes. Why can't the Nazis rule on their own just yet? You're going to pause. And um, I, I don't think I am, actually. OK, your answers. What did you come up with? I'm going to pretend like I'm listening. Good answer. Yeah, I like what you said there, um, especially you um, and you. And um, what I have here is the actual answer, and you might have already got this. The Nazis don't have two thirds majority. They've got a lot. But if you look, if all the other parties, the communists here or the SPD here or the Zentrum Party, I said we'd come back to those, or the nationalist, the DNVP, uh, the German National People's Party, because people in Germany begin to be, it's folk. Um, these are enough if they stack up on top of one another to beat the Nazis in a single vote. This means that the Nazis could theoretically lose a vote about a new law. Um, hang on one moment. I am recording this at home. Why aren't you working? I've got someone to talk to on the so yeah, they could have theoretically lost a vote. Sorry, I paused. You didn't notice that because, well, it's just the way things work. Okay, second task then. How many votes do you think the Nazis gained in favour of the enabling law, making Hitler a virtual dictator? How many people do you think are going to agree with what the Nazis want to do? How many votes do you think were cast against? How many people voted against what the Nazis were going to do, saw the danger and stopped it? When you're answering this question, think carefully about who might have been excluded from the vote and why they might be excluded from the vote. Uh, you can pause, obviously, um, before you answer the question. Uh, I will wait here and pretend like I'm going to wait. So here's the pause. OK, that many. Have you considered the nationalists? Are they going to vote against or for? Uh, don't worry about the exact numbers. Uh, let's say they're around about 48 and you've got 288. So what would that be? 336 maybe in favour and you reckon the Zentrum would vote against. Yeah, they're Catholics after all. They're good Christians. They're not going to vote for a dictator. Uh, the SPD, well obviously they're not going to vote for Hitler because they're a socialist party. So, oh and the communists. So the communists have got what? 75 seats. The SPD have got what? 116. Uh, so that's 180. Um, 191. Uh, then you've got the Zentrum, they're around about 60, so that's 250 something. It's going to come pretty close. You're going to end up with 330 versus 250 something. Um, okay, well, here's the answer. Well, first of all, the KPD aren't there. Hitler's expelled them. He uses the Reichstag fire decree to essentially say, no, 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 you're not allowed in, and he protects the entire area with the SA. Now, were I doing this on um, a whiteboard, I'd be able to draw at this point. So bear with me. I'm going to draw with my hands and you're going to have to imagine it. The Kronoch House has a sort of auditorium that's sort of this shape. It's sort of a huge D shape. And at the bottom it goes straight. Uh, there you go. And the stage just sticks out underneath. So you've got this huge auditorium and it's split into two seating areas like a proper theatre. And at the bottom, because it's theatre, the Kroll Opera House, sorry, I haven't explained this. They moved the Reichstag from the burned down Reichstag building to the Kroll Opera House, because why not? So you've got this uh, auditorium seating, you've got a stage at the bottom where everybody sat. And on one side of the hall, um, yeah, on that side of the hall, you've got the, um, the SPD, those that get through, and you've got the Zentrum. On the other side, you've got the DNVP and you've got the Nazis. Now, keep in mind, the Nazis all turn up in uniform. They turn up in SA uniform very deliberately. They're all dressed in military uniform. 
And to protect the Kroll Opera House from being burned down by terrorists, the Nazis decide to protect it with the SA. So outside, everybody that isn't in an SA uniform gets a bit roughed up. Oh, why are you here? You cannot come in straight away. We do not know your name. Why is he get through? Oh, he's a Nazi. I know his name. You? I do not know your name. And then, uh, oh, we must like to look at your papers. Oh, no, you, you geek, you have dropped them. You must have to pick them up. And, oh, I've accidentally kicked you in the butt while you do so. Also, I need to search you because you may be bringing in fire lighting materials. That was an appalling German accent. I apologize. Uh, but you get the idea. The essay basically intimidate. They scare people on the way in. When they get into the Kroll Opera House, they surround the section um, that isn't sat in by the Nazis. Wait, which side did I put it? I put it on this side, didn't I? They surround that section there that isn't sat in by the Nazis with the SA, and they're all looking inwards. We are here for your protection, but we are worried about you. There may be terrorists in amongst you, so we will be looking at you very carefully. And they've sort of got nightsticks, tap, tap, tap. And um, it's intimidating. These people are scared. But even then, the Nazis can't be certain they're going to win the vote. At this point, there's an absolute masterstroke, and Hitler, the Rise of Evil shows this quite neatly. Uh, they've got to stand up to vote. That's how they do it. They, they sort of show their vote by standing up, and you can see what they're doing. When you play the national anthem, what do you do? That's right, you stand up. So, when the vote is held, and it looks like maybe the Nazis aren't going to get close to unanimous. They need a lot of people on site to look good in the press. Goering stands up and starts singing the national anthem. Deutschland, Deutschland, über alles. And everybody stands. Well, I say everybody stands. A lot of people stand because they're standing. Why? They voted to allow Hitler to become a dictator. Ah, du um, You begin to see how this works. You begin to see why the numbers are what they are. So the KPD aren't there to vote against it. The communists would never vote for such a thing. And uh, then you've got the paramilitary groups intimidation. They're forcing people to do things their way. They're scaring them. And then the vote is carried. It's 441 votes for and only 94 votes against. That is a very brave bunch of 94 people. The national anthem is playing. They're being watched by uniformed people and have already shown they're prepared to rough people up that are holding nightsticks that are actually threatening you. And they still refuse to stand. That is an amazing position to be in. And also slightly terrifying. I, I can't imagine many people, myself included, that will be able to do that. So... Well done, those brave 94 people. Unfortunately, their bravery means diddly squat, because it's passed anyway. Um, in fact, at this point, you need to pause and you need to watch the next video clip on the Show My Homework section. Don't worry, I'll be here when you get back. Okay, hopefully you've watched that now and you've seen that it's a reasonably good uh, facsimile of what occurred. You might notice a lot of my way of talking about it. I've stolen from the film because they do do quite a good job. Um, what does this mean? It means now that Hitler can pass laws without asking the Reichstag for any kind of help whatsoever. He can do pretty much what he likes, when he likes. And if you remember that timeline at the beginning, that's precisely what he does. The consequence? By July 1933, all political parties apart from the Nazis are banned. The NSDAP is the only official and legal way you can be involved in politics. Okay, is this legal? Or is this violent? Well, on the face of it, this is entirely legal. It's a law passed in the Reichstag. It changes the legalities, it changes the law of Germany. It's legal. But remember that intimidation. Remember the fact that they rough people up on the way in. Remember the fact that they expel the KPD and they're being arrested. Those communists are being arrested and they're being held by the paramilitary group, that private army, the SA. That's violence. And it's up to you to decide which is more important. Remember that intimidation in the chamber itself as well when they're holding the vote. That is violence. And again, it's up to you to decide whether or not it's more legal or more violent. Violence doesn't have to be carried out on ordinary people in order for it to count. The last thing I'm going to talk about is in 1934. Be careful, people often get this confused. 
it's a different year. These first two years, this first chapter of how the Nazis go from chancellor to dictatorship, how they consolidate their power, is the first section. When I talked about how to organize your notes, this is the first section, these first two years. It's very weird to think of it that way, and I'm doing it in a single PowerPoint, but that's how it works. This is a skipping on. So we've gone from the enabling law in March 1933 and the Reichstag fire in February 1933 to the Night of the Long Knives in 1934. And here I have uh, a British cartoon carried in a satirical magazine uh, called They Salute With Both Hands Now, um, a British cartoon from July 1934. And I don't know if you've noticed, you've got the SA over here saluting with both hands. They've got their hands up. What does that mean? Exactly. It means surrender. It means they refuse to fight. In the background here, you've got a bunch of people with rifles, note the helmets. Do you know who they are? Well done. That's the German Wehrmacht. It's the German army working with Hitler himself here. Now, I don't know if you can see this on your version, um, but on his uh, armband here, it says the double cross, um, because it was often referred to as the twisted cross in Britain. Uh, here we have Hitler's unkept promises on the floor. And down the bottom here, you've got, well, I don't know if you recognize him, well done, it's Goebbels as a lapdog. This man here, you might know because of something I've told you about him already. Do you remember? Of course you do. It's Goering. He believes he's the reincarnation of a 10-year-old Norwegian princess. Here he is with a Norwegian spear, Norwegian helmet, because Vikings, and um, long hair, because princess. Uh, what's going on with these feet here? Correct. They're people that Hitler has already shot in full view of all the SA, therefore carrying them into submission. Because... By 1934, Hitler's external position is relatively secure. Only Hindenburg can sack him now. Parliament, Reichstag can't vote him out because they're rarely meeting and Hitler can rule without them anyway. And Hindenburg has no desire to. Hindenburg doesn't like democracy. He hates democracy. He's a general. As far as he's concerned, Democrats destroyed the war effort. It was all their fault they lost the First World War. I mean, it wasn't, but that was Hindenburg's idea. So he doesn't like democracy anyway. So his external position is relatively secure. No one can really get rid of him, apart from the army and apart from Hindenburg. Within the party, though, Ernst Röhm and others like him, Strasser and uh, a bloke called Von Kahr, you don't really need to know about him, uh, Von Kahr is spelled V-O-N space, capital K, A-H-R. Don't ask me why Von doesn't get a capital, it just doesn't. Um, it's kind of like Sir, I guess. Um, and opposition within his party, particularly the SA, on what he's most worried about. Um, Rome's ambition was to have a brown revolution. The brown tide of the SA would wash away the grey rock of the Wehrmacht. Yes, he actually used the words brown tide. Rome's not terribly good at speeches. It, it, well, yes, I don't think I need to explain this one. Sorry, parents, I am referring to diarrhea. No, I'm not going to spell it. Um, Rome's ambition was a, a brown revolution, that the SA would sweep into the Reichstag building, take control and destroy it. And you could argue, well, why did Hitler have to carry out the, uh, the, the, the Night of the Long Knives? Uh, I think there's a card sword on one of these slides. So if you go down far enough, you'll see there's a bunch of titles with explanations. Uh, now is a good time to carry that out, if you wish to. Uh, I think it's slide three, but don't quote me on that one. Um, so um, if you want to do it, pause now. Okay, you've done that. So now you know the answers. I'll go through those in a moment. Don't worry. Um, what happens as a result of this? Well, 200 people are arrested directly and they're taken to Munich um, where they're murdered whilst presumably saluting Hitler. Hi, Hitler! Um, and at this point, you're going to watch the third clip in that sequence to explain what happens to Ernst Röhm. Uh, so you've seen it on the show, my homework. Go watch that now. I'll still be here when you get back. Watched it? Good. Then you know what happens next. Um, the deal is, in return for getting rid of the SA, in return for getting rid of Ernst Röhm, in return for declaring him an enemy of the people, the German Wehrmacht, the German army, declare their support for the Nazis and say they will not carry out any attempt to seize power. Hitler has now dealt with all of his problems. There is nobody who's going to come in and spoil his day by taking away his power. Only Hindenburg can sack him, and Hindenburg by this point is pretty much housebound. He's old and he's ill, and he doesn't like democracy anyway. At this point, Hitler is secure. 
He's done it. He's gone from Chancellor on the 30th of January 1933, and he's pretty much reached dictator level already. There's only one person left, that's Hindenburg. And why is there only one person left? Well, as you saw in the video clip, he's got blokes to go around and basically murder people um, under the cover of, well, national chaos. Hitler said, in this moment, I was supreme judge of the German nation. Well, he wasn't. He sat on a boat and didn't do anything because he sort of froze and went a bit weird. Hang on a minute. This sounds awfully violent. Wandering around the country, murdering people, shooting them as they go out to get milk. That was Von Kahr, by the way. Um, or was it Strasser? Strasser. Sorry, Von Kahr's the guy that killed uh, while he's taking a shave and he gets his throat slit. Um, Strasser is the guy going out to get the milk and they sort of drive by and they shoot him with a machine gun. Um, that sounds pretty violent. There can't be any legal stuff here except that quote. In this moment, said Hitler, I was supreme judge of the German nation. Hitler saw this as a point of a legality. He changes the way the country works from this point onwards. Adolf Hitler is actually the supreme judge of the German nation. Hans Frank, a lawyer, will later say this is how the German law begins to work. He is the supreme judge. Hitler makes himself the legal authority of German political power. That's legality. That's a legal method. And it's a very specific and a very deliberate use of the legal system. If you're writing an essay, you can say that all of these events have both legal and violent within them. Now, I think it's safe to say that the Night of the Long Knives, N-O-T-L-K, uh, O and T can be lowercase. So you only need the N, the L and the K as being uppercase. The Night of the Long Knives, the Nacht der Langen Messe, if you prefer the German, that is mainly violent, but there's definitely an element of legal within it. The enabling law, that is mainly legal, but there's definitely an element of violence in it. And the Reichstag fire, followed by the Reichstag fire decree, is kind of half and half. It's up to you to decide how much of those things, which relative importance switches it as to whether it's mainly legal or mainly uh, violence. But that's what we mean by relative importance. Remember at the start of this lesson I said, that's what I'm aiming towards. So Hitler deals with all the rivals, he gets the army on side, and after that, Hitler becomes legally a dictator. Oh, sir, you've answered the question. Obviously, it's mostly legally. Well, no, that was part of the Nazi ideal. It's part of the Nazi propaganda. How legal is this? And that's the big question. You've got to decide that one. You might have noticed, I'm not a fan of the idea that it is. That said, if you can explain it, you'll still get the marks. I, I'm not here to enforce an opinion. You have your own opinions. And if you can explain them, they will always work. That's how history works. We're not here to tell you what to think. We're here to tell you how to present what you think and how to make an argument out of it and how to make a case. So don't worry. If you agree, disagree with me, that is fantastic. If you agree with me, that is also fantastic. Um, I do not mind, just provided you explain it well. Oh, whoops. Um, after Hindenburg's death, Hitler becomes Führer. And at that point, he can do whatever he wants. Now, I warned you that this was a source-based unit. This is almost entirely about an essay. So I need to come to a source bit. Uh, and to do that, I need to take my physog off here. How do I do that? I do it like that. There we go. Um, so here we have a source. It's a photo manipulation. Yeah, they existed back in the 30s as well. This one is by a communist, um, a bloke who changes his name. Um, and he changes it to John Hartfield. He said, if, if uh, it was Jan Hetzfeld, uh, and he said, well, if to be a German, you have to be a Nazi. I'm not a Nazi, therefore I'm not a German. So he changes his name to an English version, John Hartfield, and then runs away to Czechoslovakia, as you do. He's working in Prague at this point. And this photo manipulation, um, if you look at it, it's got a date on it. Uh, it's in German. It doesn't take a genius to figure out that month. I'm not going to tell you. You can figure that one out for yourself. And underneath you've got Heil Hitler, the Nazi salute. And in the picture, you've got a man giving the Nazi salute. So what can source A, this is source A, tell us about the methods Hitler used to make himself dictator in Germany between 1933 and 1934? Now, even if you don't understand the source, you absolutely know, because I've mentioned it several times, that the exam board are very keen with legal and violent methods. So using the source and your own knowledge to support your answer, 
What can this tell us? This is another one of those inference questions, the mark scheme I showed you in the last lesson. Which is this, legal or violent, or is it a combination of the two? You can pause here, have a think about it, have an answer of it, and then we'll come back. Okay, I'm gonna assume we've had a go at writing the answer down. Should be around about two paragraphs long. There should be a um, sort of inference about the purpose and the intended audience, and an explanation about what it shows us about the methods. If you remember, this is a communist artist. It's down the side there, you can't actually see it. It says cartoon, it's this bit here. It says cartoon by the communist artist, John Hartfield in August, 1934. Note, August, 1934. Now, if I'd given you that date, and if you'd had that up to hand, but I think you will if you've uh, had a look on the next slide in this before the lesson began. Um, you might know something about August. What do you know about August? That's right, it's when, uh, oh, hang on, you can't see me. Try again. That's right, it's when Hindenburg dies and Hitler becomes Fuhrer. This is a couple of months after the events that this image is about take place. So it's, it's looking back, it's a retrospective. And what John Hartfield is saying to his audience, who are his audience, well done, it's the German people. He's saying, remember, Remember what happened just earlier this year? And, and do you think it's a good idea that Hitler's taking power now, that he's combined the offices of president and chancellor and made this Führer thing? Do you think that's a good thing? Oh, you do? Oh, well, look what he does to people who actually like him. Yes, this is a reference to the Knight of the Long Knives. And it's both violence, but legal. Because the thing he's referring to, August 1934, is a legal assumption of power. But he's reminding people it's based on the violence. How does he do that? Well, you might have noticed that the shirt here is just covered in blood. These are bullet wounds. You might have noticed that the man is dead. You might have noticed he's on a cracked marble floor. You might have noticed that the rigor mortis has set in on this salute. He's been shot while saluting. Hitler will destroy even people that are loyal to him. And if he's prepared to do it to his friends, what's he prepared to do to you who he doesn't care about. That's what this image is all about. So how's the mark scheme work? Um, so, hang on, will it work? It does. Level zero, zero marks, yes, there is a level zero, is answers using surface features of the source only, describing the source or not answering the question. The man is saluting Hitler. It says 30 Juni 1934, but it's in German, so I don't know what it means. Sorry to say it's actually a genuine response from a student of a previous year group, so I apologise. That would get nothing. Well done, you. You have seen the source. Big up. Um, level one, one and two marks, links a feature of the source to the question, but it is surface features only. It shows violence was used because the man is in an SA uniform. Well done. You could even develop that. The SA were a paramilitary force. That's a private army for the Nazis. And they went around beating people up after the Reichstag fire. Therefore, this proves violence was used. Well done. You say, well, sir, he's made an inference. Yeah, but he hasn't made an inference about the audience, the receipt, or the purpose of the source. It's an inference about the content of the source. As a consequence, that would only get two marks. Next level up, you begin to talk, talk about what it shows with the benefits and limitations of the particular source in context. You are essentially inferring from the purpose, the receipt, or the audience of the source. Here we go. It shows that violence and the threat of violence was used. This poster specifically refers to the Knights of the Long Knives in June 1934, and it's helpful. Note, there's your inference. It's an inference about utility. Helpful is utility. As it fits with the situation at the time when 200 people were killed by the army in the SS in the SA. However, it is by an opponent of the NSDAP, so it may be exaggerated to show more violence than legal methods. That's pretty good. It's worth five marks. You've got the purpose, it's an opponent, they're trying to discredit the Nazis, they're going to focus on the violence rather than the legal methods. But you've also got the context. It's referring to something that the writer knows is to do with a violent method of seizing power. How do you get the top marks? Does the same as level two, but securely and with multiple specifics. May include the blood spattered SA uniform, the reference to the Night of the Long Knives in 1934, a communist artist and how they review the NSDAP. It may include the murder of loyal members, Ernst Röhm, for example. Note I couldn't get the umlaut, so I go R O E H M. Uh, Röhm uh, is R O umlaut H M. Uh, umlaut to the two dots above the R O. Might include references to the Reichstag fire. I made that reference earlier. Uh, it might include the decree 
uh, and the enabling law, um, the decree being the right to drag fire decree, sorry, and the enabling law, obviously the enabling law of March 1933. Uh, it might include the creation of a deliberate climate of fear. And you're like, say you've not mentioned that. And I go, no, I haven't yet, but it will come fairly close afterwards. So there's a reason this turns up at this point. Um, it might include the passing of decrees after March 1933. So there's a series of different laws Hitler passes to generally take power. That's your timeline that you stuck into your notes, the non-bolded bits. And it might also include the August 1934 uh, oath of loyalty to Hitler from the army itself, which I do remember telling you about. You might refer to that. So hopefully, if you've written an answer, you know roughly what level it fits in and why. Uh, and you're beginning to see how that first question works. There is another question, uh, it's worth 15 marks, and it goes through all the different sources. Now you remember in Elizabethans, there were two interpretations. You don't know anything about these historians. You can just base them on their audience and what they're trying to do. Now you can do that and know a little bit because they're going to be using sources from the time. So the job of you will be in that 15 mark question to take sources and put them in the context, like in level two, which is down that way. No, wait, down on that way. Um, I can point, I must have had. Uh, level two over there, uh, sorry, here, there we go. And that is roughly what you'll need to do three times with three different sources in another question. That sort of analysis, but more on that later, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, oops. Ah, this is that card sort of thing that we were doing earlier. If you want to know the answers, Rome's ambition uh, refers to uh, Rome wanting the SA to replace the army. Um, rumours of Rome wanting to uh, replace Hitler, which could also go into Hitler's insecurity. Uh, and uh, that'll do. Uh, Hitler's insecurity had other rivals he needed to scare by taking out Ernst Rome. Uh, the SA seemed chaotic and by no, that's not it. It's there. The SA were powerful and not fully controlled. You've got public opinion. The SA had a rep reputation for drunken brawling, and they seem chaotic and violent, scaring ordinary Germans. And you will therefore notice that you've got two under each heading. There are three columns, of course, but you probably spotted that when I mentioned the task. And the idea is you should put them under a proper heading. This allows you to explain things very simply. So if you ever asked about uh, Ernst Röhm and the SA and why Hitler had to deal with them, that's what this slide is all about. Reminder about this one. Here are all the questions that hopefully I've answered. If I haven't, do pop a comment on the show my homework and I'll get back to it as quickly as I can. There's, whoops, there's that question that you've just had to answer. Uh, write your answer in your neat books, then mark it using the marks you revealed on the board after some discussion. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. And just a reminder, here's those timelines with those sources so you can see them for yourself. If you've got a printer on, that's amazing. And if you don't, I do apologize. Um, I don't know what to do. Uh, you can write your tales, I suppose, but take your time, make it neat. Um, whoops, oh, woo! there we go. Um, that was fun. Hopefully that's made sense and hopefully your understanding of it. If you want to, you can now watch the remaining part of the Hit on the Rise of Evil because by now I'm fairly certain, like me, you're vaguely invested in how that ends. Um, even though you kind of know how that ends, it'll end with the oath of loyalty to Hitler and then it goes through, well, the end credits. But it's worth watching those end credits and seeing for yourselves. I would play it on here, but the last time I tried to play a video on here, it was, it was atrocious. I'm not going to try that again. Uh, so all of the various links are there. Find the YouTube video. It's, it, all the clips that I've given you are from there. And just play them through to the end this time if you want to do so. I hope this has been useful. This has been lesson four. Um, it might take physically two lessons within a, a, a timetable, but I can publish them. Remember, uh, and this has come up over the time, I'm publishing these lessons fairly quickly. You are not supposed to keep up with these at the rate of three a week. That's insane. I've extended the time on the show my homework tasks to try and reflect that. The idea is that you do these at your own pace. If you need to pause, if you need to go back, if you need to go back over the notes, then please do. If there are any problems, drop a comment on the show my homework task that you've been set. And that will let me or your teacher know that you're not keeping up or you're worried about things and we'll be able to respond fairly quickly. They will hang around. As far as I understand it from your perspective, anything that looks like it's late or has already passed, you can still access. Just go back to them at your own pace. Let us know where you're up to. If you need any help, just ask. These are very strange times. We're doing our best. I'm hoping this will keep you up to speed so that when inevitably we return, and it be that in September or before, you've got something to work with and something to refer to. That's the point behind these. So um, 
follow government guidelines, make good decisions, stay at home, and I'll see you uh, on the, well, you will see me on the, uh, the next lesson, lesson five. It'll be released later this week. Thank you very much, year 10.